and quickly. And Welcome to Falcon Physician Review's Neurology Lecture Series. The next section will cover cognition, language, and memory. The left hemisphere of the brain primarily subserves language. The production of language is subserved by the left frontal lobe, and comprehension of language is subserved by the left temporal, superior temporal lobe. It's also at the temporal parietal junction, so it's at the very back portion of the, lat the lateral fissure, the sylvian fissure. An aphasia of the Broca's type is called a non-fluent or expressive aphasia. People with these, this type of an aphasia have a uh, lesion in the left inferior frontal lobe, and these people will speak in halting sentences. They're unable to get the words out fluently. They may have frustra uh, frustration in their speech, and uh, sometimes are able to curse in a very fluent manner. So that seems to be a different, subserved by a different area of the brain. But when they're trying to put together sentences that are complex in nature, they have real difficulty putting those words together. That's called a Broca's or non-fluent aphasia. On the other hand, a person has a Wernicke's aphasia if they are able to speak quite fluently, but unable to comprehend speech. And their, flu their fluency of their speech may be quite difficult to understand. So these people have a lesion in the left posterior temporal parietal region, the superior portion of the temporal gyrus or the temporal lobe, and right at the junction between the parietal and temporal region. These people may speak fluent gibberish, where the words that they're saying make no sense at all. However, the people are not aware of their own deficit, so they have poor insight into this aphasia. They are unable to comprehend speech, and they are not frustrated about their deficit. And a, a conductive aphasia is a lesion of the left arcuate fasciculus. This is the connection between Wernicke's and Broca's area, so this would be a damage to the left parietal region. These people, if you would imagine, they have no way to take information in and quickly spit it out. So what would you think their deficit would be? Well, it's a deficit of re repetition. If you ask them to comprehend what you're saying, they're able to do it. If you ask them to speak fluently, they're able to do it. But when you ask them to repeat a complex sentence like no ifs, ands, or buts, they have a lot of trouble getting that word, getting those words out. And they may ask you to repeat that again. You may find it very strange that they're unable to repeat that sentence for you. A global aphasia is simply a large MCA stroke that may affect both Wernicke's and Broca's areas. So these people are unable to speak fluently and unable to comprehend speech. A clinical vignette to solidify this information. A 60-year-old male presents with speech difficulties. He developed this difficulty following a left-sided stroke from which he is currently recovering. He is a diabetic who has been on insulin for 10 years, and he is also a chronic smoker. On physical exam, his speech lacks fluency. He has a difficulty finding certain words, and his comprehension is well-preserved, as are higher mental functions. He has motor weakness of the right upper and lower limbs, with exaggerated deep tendon reflexes and right-sided Babinski's reflex. This patient with his inability to speak fluently, has a Broca's aphasia, or a non-fluent aphasia, and his lesion would be in the left inferior frontal lobe. Let's do another clinical vignette. A 51-year-old right-handed male is brought to the emergency room by his relatives because they have noticed that although he speaks fluently, he has begun to use inappropriate words and phrases to refer to ordinary objects and events in his daily life. He suffers from chronic hypertension that has been treated with calcium channel blockers. On physical exam, you note hypertension, uh, blood pressure of 170 over 120. On physical exam, you also note confusion. He makes paraphrasic errors, words that, words that sound appropriate, but that have, for example, an inappropriate letter substituted. So an example of a paraphrasic, paraphrasic error would be if I were trying to say word and I said bird instead. And those usually go by unnoticed by most people, but a neurologist hears something like that and they say, that was a paraphasic error. I wonder if he has something 
a little damage in the left parietal region, right near the temporal lobe, parietotemporal junction. So this would be a Wernicke's type aphasia or a fluent aphasia. Let's talk more about cognition, language, and memory by going to the right hemisphere. The right hemisphere is, subserves primarily spatial relations and abstract reasoning. So you might think of this as something that uh, architects need or people that play Tetris might need. You need to be able to figure out the spatial relations, do mental rotation, such things as that. Parietal lesions uh, will cause a, a syndrome that is interesting called hemineglect. And the right parietal lesion is the classical uh, lesions for the for contralateral hemineglect. But you can also get neglect from a left parietal lesion. These people will ignore an entire half of the space that they're looking at. So they are they neglect it. They also may neglect parts of their body. If you held your their hand up to their face, they may deny that that hand is theirs. Uh, there's a lot of interesting tests that we do. We ask them to draw a clock and they may put all the numbers of the clock on one side of that clock, and that would suggest that they have neglect. They also have difficulty synthesizing sensory information. So if we were to test things like stereognosis, stereognosis is the ability to put something in your hand and uh, without even looking at it, to take that sensory information and make it into a construct. So if you were to put a key in my hand, and I had a parietal lobe lesion on the contralateral side, I wouldn't be able to tell you that it was a key. If you put it on my good side, I'd say immediately, oh yes, that's got rough edges over here, smooth edges over here, this must be a key. Another way we test parietal lobe function is to do a test called graphesthesia, where we actually draw a number on the hand, and uh, we ask this, uh, the patient without looking at it to say what that felt like, what did it, what does it feel like, what number was it? And so if they're able to tell us, then they have intact graphesthesia. If they're unable to tell us, they have agraphesthesia. Frontal lobe region is very important for planning and thought. We call it executive function, the ability to take uh, a number of different functions and put it together to solve a problem. This is the area of the brain that is developed most over the other animals or humans. So humans have a large frontal lobe, and we are presumably able to uh, solve problems well by putting together all of our facilities and deciding which way to solve the problem. The other important thing that is subserved by the frontal lobe is social appropriateness. So if a person has a frontal lobe lesion, they may be disinhibited. They may be uh, saying inappropriate things at parties, or they may like to take off all their clothes. Uh, this disinhibition is seen in frontotemporal dimensions, such as Pick's disease, and other types of frontal temporal dimensions. Here is an image of the frontal lobe atrophy that is quite marked in Pick's disease. You can see that the frontal lobe is preferentially atrophied over the rest of the brain. The frontal lobe has wide sulci and very narrow gyri. This is often called knife edge atrophy, and that's seen in frontal temporal dementia. A person with this type of uh, atrophy of the brain would be very disinhibited, disinhibited and would not uh, adhere to social norms. Let's look at the temporal lobe. The temporal lobe is very important for memory and emotion. It's certainly the medial temporal lobe, the hippocampus and parahippocampal regions are extremely critical for forming new memories. The, uh, the amygdala is also in the medial temporal lobe and one should think of that as being important for an emotional response and ability to recognize emotional signals from uh, other people. People with amygdala lesions often have difficulty recognizing facial expressions as anger or surprise or sadness. There's another level of social appropriateness that happens when bilateral uh, temporal lobe lesions occur. This is called Kluver-Busey syndrome. Kluver-Busey syndrome occurs if there's widespread damage to bilateral temporal lobes. Monkeys with such lesions will be hypersexual, they will explore the environment orally, and uh, they sometimes are placid in some ways. Here is the amygdala in a, in a coronal section. Uh, you see that it's in the same location that the hippocampus is, except that it's a little bit more anterior in the brain. 
Here's another picture of the amygdala on a close-up view. Uh, you see the amygdala has a smooth area of the brain uh, with gray matter and many different nuclei inside the amygdala. And the parahippocampal gyrus is right next to it. The angiorhinal cortex is right next to the amygdala as well. The angiorhinal cortex seen here by, depicted here by EC, is uh, a region of the brain that's important in memory formation, and you'll see it in page circuit, which we'll describe now. The limbic system is a term that means between real primary sensory cortices and uh, emotional uh, regions of the brain. So think of the limbic system as being important in memory and emotion, and the main circuit that one talks about when one talks about the limbic system is page circuit. Page circuit goes like this. Starts with the hippocampus or antorhinal region. Uh, the hippocampus will send its fibers out via the fornix to synapse into the mammillary bodies. Mammillary bodies will send fibers out to the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. The anterior nucleus of the thalamus will send fibers into the cingulate gyrus, and their information will filter back into the entorhinal cortex, where it can then proceed again through the circuit through the hippocampus and fornix and so on. Let's draw it out for you. Information is filtered into the entorhinal cortex. It then enters into the hippocampus itself through the perforant pathway. This is a fiber track that connects entorhinal to hippocampal uh, uh, cells. The hippocampus has a large white matter tract that is the primary output of the hippocampus. It's called the fornix. That fornix ends in the mammillary bodies where a synapse will occur, and the mammillary bodies will send an output to the anterior nucleus of the thalamus, and the anterior nucleus of the thalamus will send its output into the cingulate gyrus, which will then filter back information into the entorhinal cortex. That's paved circuit. Think of it as important in memory and emotion. Uh, not everything is worked out uh, in current science with the PAPE circuit, but it is a very clearly highly interconnected set of structures that is important just neuroanatomically at least. Let's do some clinical vignettes. A 15-year-old male is brought to a physician by his parents for evaluation of recently observed overindulgence in sexual activities. The parents also report that the patient's behavior has recently changed markedly from aggressive to extremely placid. Directed questioning reveals that he has now started exploring things orally and has developed a voracious appetite. He suffered from herpes simplex encephalitis a few months ago. There is no history of prior psychiatric illness in the patient or in the family. On physical exam, the patient is in excellent health and is apparently unconcerned about his illness. He displays no reaction to his parents' complaints, and when the physician attempts to shake his hand, patient begins to orally explore it. So this is clearly a uh, uh, damage to bilateral temporal lobes, which can happen in herpes simplex encephalitis, and bilateral temporal lobe damage can lead to Kluver-Busey syndrome, which this uh, case represents. He is hyperoral, hypersexual, and may have placidity or aggressiveness. Here is an MRI scan. This is called a flare sequence, which has uh, sensitivity to damage within the intraparenchymal tissue. Uh, what you see here are very large uh, temporal horns of the lateral ventricle. So in the temporal lobe you see very large uh, uh, areas of CSF and therefore the hippocampus must be missing here. The hippocampus is markedly damaged in this, uh, in this image. Also you can see the white areas of the temporal lobes that represents damage to the white matter around there as well. So this is a T2-weighted MR scan, even though the CSF is dark. And the reason for that is that we now have pulse sequences that will null the signal from CSF. And so they, even though they used to be able, you used to be able to say, well, if the CSF is bright on an MRI, that is a T2 sequence. And if it's dark, it's T1. Well, it's no longer the case because of flare, where we can actually create a T2 sequence, a T2 weighted image with dark CSF. It allows us to highlight the intraparenchymal damage, and that's what we see here. Another clinical vignette, the 73 year old male is brought to the clinic by his family to address his progressive memory impairment. His wife reports that he was forced to stop working because he was making an increasing number of mistakes. 
She reports that he has stopped all of his prior hobbies and that he repeats questions despite just having been told the answer. On physical exam, his blood pressure is normal. His mental status exam reveals severe impairment for recent memory. He is disoriented to today's date and cannot recite any current events. He is unable to retain three unrelated words in memory after a brief distraction. There is no impaired consciousness and no focal deficits revealed by the rest of his neurologic exam. Well, in this age group with progressive memory impairment, the primary thing you would think about is Alzheimer's disease. And one might be able to look at brain imaging and see marked hippocampal atrophy in Alzheimer's disease. So one thing that you should think about as a structure of the brain that is involved in Alzheimer's disease is the hippocampus. And here's what we see uh, is large temporal horns of the lateral ventricle as the hippocampus atrophies away. This is also a disease of acetylcholine. Uh, we, our primary medications for treating uh, Alzheimer's disease are acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. That increases our uh, acetylcholine in the brain and can uh, hide some of the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease as the person gets a little bit of improvement in their memory. But right now we don't really have any med medications that can stop the progression of Alzheimer's disease. The two patho pathologic hallmarks of, hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease are neurofibrillary tangles and amyloid plaques. So those are two things that you should keep in mind when you think of Alzheimer's disease. Neurofibrillary tangles and amyloid plaques. So there are lots of treatments that are coming down the pike. A lot of drug companies want to get, uh, to get a, uh, a treatment for this disease because there's so many people that are affected by it. And as our population ages, we're going to have more and more people affected with Alzheimer's disease. So it's a critical question, critical problem, and it will translate into questions on the USMLE. That's all I can think about on Alzheimer's disease. Uh, just try to remember this. Uh, disease as, as much as you can because uh, uh, because it will be tested. I mean, it's one of these diseases that is so prevalent, you're clearly going to see these patients in your clinic. And so the USMLE will want to know that you know about uh, this disease. Another clinical vignette. An 18-year-old man presents with headache, fever, neck stiffness, memory loss, and seizures that are preceded by an olfactory aura. He was in his usual state of health until two days ago. This patient is very uncomfortable, uncomfortable with the exam, but is disoriented and to location and date and is unable to retain three unrelated items in memory after a brief distraction. He has no motor weakness or sensory deficits. Now this is a young person with memory loss and seizures. So this, in addition to fever, would really raise your suspicion for herpes simplex encephalitis. This is one of the diseases that we, as neurologists, fear quite a bit. And whenever we see a person with uh, fever and uh, what looks like meningitis, uh, we certainly uh, will look for the possibility of uh, herpes simplex encephalitis. Now, when you combine that with seizures, that's no longer just a meningitis. This is also an encephalitis, because the only way you get the seizures is if there's actual brain tissue being irritated. So this is an encephalitis. You do the lumbar puncture and you'd see a bloody uh, tap. You would see a lot of blood in there because this is a hemorrhagic infiltrate. So here indeed when you do your tap you see elevated CSF, uh, elevated white cells in the CSF and the fluid is bloody. The protein is elevated and that's because this is a hemorrhagic necrosis occurring primarily in the anterior temporal lobes and inferior frontal lobes. So that's where that air, that's where herpes simplex encephalitis tends to uh, like to attack. You may see spike waves over the anterior temporal region on your EEG because the tissue is irritated and there's epileptogenic focus. Uh, so if you look at the gross pathology, if this person comes to autopsy, you would see a very markedly bloody anterior tips of the temporal lobes. The treatment for this is intravenous acyclovir, and we will put acyclovir on in almost every at meningitis case just to cover for the possibility of herpes simplex encephalitis. Then we were sending the CSF for a herpes simplex PCR test. And if that comes back negative, then only then can we feel comfortable taking off the acyclovir. Because this can really make a difference in the person's outcome. And we uh, don't want to miss a herpes simplex encephalitis.
And because of that, you should be able to recognize it for the USMLE step one, because the people are going to, uh, the people that want you, want to test you and to see whether you're able to be out there taking care of patients, want to know that you're not going to miss herpes simplex encephalitis. This is, concludes our section for uh, reviewing cognition, memory, and language.